Let's go to chapter 14 very quickly. Uh, chapter 14 is the second time we bump into the 144,000. So if you didn't quite get it then, you're going to get a redose of it now. The 144,000 are in chapter 7 and chapter 14. The 144,000 are in the Bible for this reason. During the worst time for the human race, God offers salvation more completely than any other time in history. There are more people that get saved during the tribulation than any other single period of time, more than in Christ's ministry, more than in Paul's ministry, more than Billy Graham's ministry, okay? More than Word of Life's ministry. More people get saved in the tribulation. God, who doesn't exaggerate, says it's uncountable the number of people saved during the tribulation. Why? Because there are 144,000, the ones that are right here in, in chapter 14. It says in verse 1, And I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having the Father's name written on their foreheads. Remember we looked at Ezekiel 9, 4, and there was a mark on the forehead of those that sighed over sin, those that truly hated sin and loved God. It's the same image. And I heard a voice from heaven. And I heard the sound of harpists playing harps. So there's musical instruments in heaven, okay, if you ever wondered. Verse 3, they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures. And no one knew that song except 144,000. Everybody wants significance and everybody wants purpose in life. Did you know that God designed them for a specific purpose and they did it and forever they're going to be remembered for that? And guess what? He designed you for a specific purpose. We're all spiritual snowflakes. There are no two of us alike. Don't try and be someone else. Don't try and do what someone else does. Do what God designed and called you to do. And you know what? If you get close to the Lord, he gives you the desires of your hearts. That means that what you want to do is what he wants you to do. That's so exciting. Did you know there's nothing else in the world I'd rather do? There's a lot of other things I could do. I mean, I bought my first part building when I was 17. I, I made so much money when I was a young person. All that's interesting. But there is one thing that consumes me to know and understand and communicate God's word. What did God create you to do? That's what you should want. Look at what the Lord says about him in verse 4 of chapter 14. These are the ones who are not defiled with women. That's how we know they're men. These are young men who went through a period of time when there is more immorality than any other time in history. You understand that? That's, we already covered that in chapter 9. Everyone on the planet was unwilling in chapter 9 to repent of their drug usage, their murders and thefts and fornication. See, what's going to happen is the pornified society that you guys are growing up in is only going to get exponentially worse. You know, we have, what, 4G, 5G? Can you imagine when they get to 10G when you can stream at a gigabyte per second into your phone that you can have HD, 4K, constant, with no interruption, no gap, no lag, no buffering, and just watch everything you want to watch at any moment, unlimited. There's going to be absolute demonized, lust-filled filth in this world. And look at these guys. They did not defile themselves in immorality. They are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Wow. You know, the Lord isn't just interested in them being like that. He's interested in us following him. John 1.43. Jesus looked at his disciples, John 1.43, and said two words that just completely distill down the whole Christian life. Two words. Follow me. Follow me. I'm Christ. Stay right behind me and go through life following me. How do I do that? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The word of God is our guide. Jesus offers to these security and joy. He, he marks them. He secures them. Basically, he offers them purity in a sea of filth. Now, I want to emphasize this because you're living in a sea of filth. Now, past generations have too. Did you know, in fact, I chuckled. Uh, I'm dyslexic. I don't know which way is the gym that way. Which way is it? That way? That way. Okay, I see you pointing. When I see that word, I chuckle because I studied Greek. Do you know what gym means? Gymnos is a Greek word. Do you know what that word means? Naked. 
It does. That's the Greek word for naked. Because the Greeks, the Romans, did all sports naked. You think it's bad in our generation? How would you like to walk on the way to dinner looking at those guys lifting weights if they had no clothes on? Oh, you know, you'd have to look away if you were godly. If you were ungodly, you'd be glued to the windows, you know? And what if it was the girls' gym night? Do you understand? In the Greco-Roman world, when you see the picture of the Olympics and the discus thrower in, in any book, did you notice the discus thrower had no clothes on and the, the spear thrower and all of the people in the Olympic Games are always portrayed with no clothes because they didn't wear any? All sports, wrestling, boxing, running, were performed gymnas in the gymnasium. Naked in the nakedium. That's how sports were. That's why homosexuality was so prevalent in the ancient world. Those little boys grew up wrestling covered with olive oil with nothing on. And they just were depraved, debauched, and homosexualized. The emperor of Rome, Nero, had a male slave as his wife. His male slave's name was Florus. And Nero, with his arm around Florus, rode in his chariot through Rome. And homosexuality was not closet, it was mainstream. In the gymnasiums, in the chariot, in the palaces, it was everywhere. How do you stay pure in a sea of filth? It's what Jesus offers. That's why Douglas walked through our parking lot. He was in a sea of filth. And when you commit fornication, it's like drinking salt water. If this was salt water out of the ocean and I was dying of thirst and I drank the salt water, I would temporarily feel like I was getting hydrated and then my thirst would only amplify. Immorality, pornography, is like drinking salt water while you're adrift dying of thirst in the ocean. You're surrounded by the ocean water, and the more you consume, the more it destroys you. That's the world of the first century, and that's the world of the 21st century.